So, hi, I'm Chris Dickey. We can talk about that. So, in classes here, especially 245 and a little bit, well, a little bit more though, you primarily learn about signal amplifiers. Now, signal amplifiers are great on a board when they're very tiny, dealing with small currents, small voltages. But when you scale up to actually driving a load, like say a speaker, a big speaker like this, a signal amplifier does not cut it. You know, when, you're, when you've got a small amplifier on a board, it has low efficiency, but you're dealing with low power to be in with. So you don't care. But when you scale up, you need to go with different topologies. So what you've probably seen before <coughs> are like the single transistor amplifiers or op amps.
but they actually can be used in place of bipolar transistors in a lot of cases. Although, interestingly enough, they behave more like MOSFETs. So. Okay. So this is something that you'll prob you probably have seen in your class. These are three amplifier topologies here. And the same things, oh, thank you. Same things with PNP. So over here, you've got your common collector amplifier, also known as emitter follower. And the idea of what happens here is your emitter tracks about 0.65 volts below your base. <coughs> and the extra current in order to make it do so without loading down your source here comes from the collector. So it just kind of goes through here. Again, this is not meant to be a course on transistors. It's kind of a little refresher, but I just need to go through it. So this is the common emitter amplifier, which those of you in Larry Lab probably know very well at this point because you just spent a lab building it two weeks ago or something. It has the output up here at the collector instead of at the emitter. And the way that it works is the same kind of way as the emitter follower. The voltage at the emitter is determined by the voltage at the base. The current through the emitter resistor is determined by the voltage across the emitter resistor, which is how resistors work. That's Ohm's law. And then since the collector current and the emitter current are almost exactly the same, your voltage across your collector resistor, your drop in this case, instead of this way, but your drop from here to here, is determined by, again, Ohm's law. But in this case, is the collector drawing a current through it. Then you have the common base amplifier. This is kind of an odd one. It's not very well understood, and it's not very common in, you know, in the real world. But it does have some very specific advantages. It also leads to some very interesting things. The way that it works is it's the same deal as a common emitter amplifier. It's just that instead of moving the base in order to cause a voltage change at the emitter, you move what's down here in order to cause a change in voltage across this resistor, which changes the emitter current, which changes the collector current. Other than that, it works the same way as the common emitter. Just the difference is what you're moving. You know, instead of moving the voltage here, you're moving the voltage here. Down here is just the same thing with PNP transistors, just for, for completeness. Notice that everything is just folded horizontally. But you can do the same thing with PNP transistors. This was not the case back when you had vacuum tubes, but now it is. Okay, so other useful circuits. This is the current source, or the current sink. The PNP one down here is more the source. The NPN one here is the sink, so to speak. And the way that they work is you again determine the voltage at the base with these diodes. Diodes, when they're on, you remember from circuits one, about 0.65 volts. So you know the voltage across them. You know the voltage drop here is approximately 0.65 volts. You know the voltage from emitter to your negative rail is about 0.65 volts. So you know, because you know the resistor here, you know the current. And unless you run into a point where your collector starts to drop below your base, this thing will try to hold the current constant. And it's the same thing here for the PNP one. You'll probably see this pretty soon in Larry Lab if you haven't already. Okay. So the next one, which is actually really interesting, is the long tail pair, also known as a differential amplifier. This makes up the input stage for most audio amplifiers. There's some exceptions, but this is what you'll usually find. So <coughs> oh, 
So I've replaced the current source, or the current sink, that, or the, sorry, replaced the resistor that we had here with a current sink. Now, in this case, what the current sink is going to do is instead of acting like a resistor and having a current through that's proportional to the voltage across it, it's just going to try and pull the same amount of current. Now, how, the, how it does that is, again, this is going back to the common base idea. When you increase the voltage, across the transistor here, it will draw more current from base, from base to emitter. So it just pulls down a little bit harder until you've got the same currents, until it's got 200 microamps total. But you'll notice that if you turn both of them the other way, the currents are still the same. It doesn't matter what the absolute voltage is, as long as you don't run into the current sink here or run into the top rail, you have the same current here or the same voltages here and here. Max, they just work. Yeah, not really. Okay. No. Yes. Okay. All right. This is a really neat circuit. It's called a current mirror. And it's called a mirror for a reason. Which 
is that okay. So the, the current through this transistor, the current that it sources from its it, from its collector here, is ideally the same as the current that this transistor has through its collector. You'll notice that they're approximately equal. This is actually a limitation of transistors. You'll notice a little bit of current flowing out of the bases there. And I turn it way up, and I turn the speed way up. But you see that the currents here are approximately equal. If I change the current here by just changing the resistance, the currents both went up. So this is really neat when you have a current somewhere that you want to be matched somewhere else. Usually what you'll do is you'll have a form of current sink on this and this will source current to something else based on how much you're sinking here. The purpose of this switch is to show that regardless of what resistance you have here, the voltage here will be adjusted to make the current here the same. Current, but these are these three circuits that I just went through, very important in specifically audio amplifier time. Okay. So there's two primary types of ampli amplifier topologies. The first one is called linear. This is what your signal amplifiers were in the classes. And the way that they work is they use the forward active region of the transistor, which you typically assume EBE equals 0.65 volts, and your collector and emitter current are about the same. And they vary the voltage across the transistor using that. The transistor is usually never fully on or fully off, but it's acting as a variable source. Switching amplifiers, in comparison, use only the saturation and cutoff regions. They only act as a switch that is saturation, which is a closed switch, the switch is on, or cut off, the switch is open. Okay. And the reason why they do that is exactly for the same reason that you'd have a switch, is because it doesn't dissipate any power when it's on, ideally. And it doesn't dissipate any power when it's off, ideally. The other thing that's important with amplifiers is the frequency range in which they can operate. So different, different topologies only work in certain frequency ranges. The audio amplifier techniques do not work at RF in the same way. And the RF amplifiers probably would not make good power supply device. So the first type of amplifier that I want to show is a class A. And that I actually have set up. Yes. So this is an approximate schematic for what I've got here. You'll notice that this transistor is conducting a lot of current right now, like 5.6 amps. And it has a significant amount of voltage across it too. This Supplies here in series. That will calm down. <laughs> and while it does seem a little janky, it actually works.
not very loud for the amount of power that it's taking right now. So it's got 36 volts across and about 2.3 amps. So it's a lot of wattage. Do you remember how there was all that current flowing continuously through the one transistor that was controlling the amplifier and the one resistor? In a class B audio amplifier, you do not have a, any single transistor conducting for more than half of the half of the wave. So in the class A amplifier, you had here's the sine wave. The single transistor was conducting the entire time. And it was just changing the amount of current. It's called bias. So your bias point was like here. And it was just almost off here, almost on here, but otherwise drawing a lot of power. In comparison, a class B amplifier's bias point is here. So any given transistor only turns on for half of the time. Now, if you had only one transistor in a class B amp, you'd have only half of the cycle. And for input like this, your output would look like that. Not very good for distortion performance. This does not look like this. However, and you may have seen this in your, in your Larry lab, those of you in Larry lab, you can take and do a push-pull design. So you have another transistor that looks like this. And when you put the two of them together, you get push-pull. Neither one of the transistors is on when you have zero watts coming out of your amplifier. So you can actually see that here. So these are the two output transistors. These right here. For the first half of the sine wave, you've got this transistor conducting. For the second half, you've got this one conducting. This one up here is only sourcing current sourcing out to the output. And this one here is only sinking current, current coming back in from the input, or current coming back in from the output. These are what the currents through them look like, right here. It's all that other junk. So that's one of the disadvantages of a class B amplifier, is you need all of this other junk to make it work. Now, this is where I was going to explain why some of the rest of this was important. So, now that I've sped everything up, I'm just looking at the signal portion of this now. So this is the signal source. It's just a 5 kilohertz source. And I've got my long-tailed pair here with a current sink. Now, remember how the currents 
in the long tail of the pair changed, both of the currents changed even though only one of them was being used for the, supply, for the output. Well, that's why there's a current mirror here. So the current mirror here matches the current, you can see the currents are about equal, matches the current here with the current here. And what it does is it increases the gain of this portion. The second stage, what? The second stage, so this is the first block in the amplifier. The second stage in the amplifier is a common emitter section. And in this case, it's actually sort of a Darlington. It's, a, it's an emitter follower followed by a common emitter. It's not really a Darlington. But in this, this is a, this is still a class A amplifier. This is still a signal type amplifier. The, the current that you see here is only like five milliamps. But notice that it is always flowing despite what's going on at the output here. <coughs> it's the voltage that you see here that changes. And notice that it gets lower current right here and then higher current. All right. So as a result of as a result of the class B here, where you're sourcing current from this one, sinking current from this one, but when they're not being used, they have no current going through them, you greatly reduce your power dissipation. Notice the size heatsink here versus here. This it's more like a 50 watt amp. It puts 50 watts into the speakers. It's also more like 70% efficient. This is about like 8% efficient, I think. And again, I was planning to have to put it up, but I ran out of time. So this is a class C amplifier. And you'll notice that, okay, so this here is a source, it's an AC source, it goes above and open below ground. But if you look here, your emitter is connected to ground. This transistor only conducts when you get above about 0.65 volts. So unlike the class B, Your conduction for a class C is actually going to be even less because you're going to have some areas on the edges where it's not conducting at all. However, when it conducts, it's going to conduct really well. It's going to have very high gain. Essentially, the transistor is just going to be like a switch. It's going to turn on for this period of time and then turn off. But there is no push-pull in this case. The way that you get any sort of performance out of a class C, and the way that you make the output anything usable, is by using it with a tuned circuit, which is what you see here. So, Coming back down. 
then when it turns on, the current is climbing here. Yeah, the current is climbing. Okay, the current climbs, but then when the transistor turns off, the current goes to zero and the voltage goes high. <coughs> so what does this mean? If you remember the, the power formula, P equals IV, the voltage across the transistor is very low, the current is high. The P equals IV, so you've got very few watts dissipated. Then when the voltage goes high and the current is zero, because the transistor is off, the transistor is also dissipating almost zero power. So that's the key with a class C, is you can have up to about 90% efficiency from a class C amplifier. However, this is a tuned circuit. Tuned circuits, if you remember from even circuits one, like to resonate at a specific frequency. And in this case, it's about seven megahertz, which is what this was picked to be. So you can't go far from seven megahertz before you start to have things not looking like a sine wave anymore. This is the output. Yep. What would be the problem of having a tuned circuit at a kilohertz? Ah, so at a kilohertz, your capacitors and inductors would both be very large. At seven megahertz, this is 1.3 microhenries. It's a couple turns of wire in air. And this is 390 picofarads. It's very small. It's a very small capacitor. At a kilohertz, you probably have more like millihenries and microfarads which are not very happy. An inductor that's millihenries, it's in the millihenry range, has a lot of resistance, and a capacitor that's that big is probably an electrolytic. So you wouldn't use this at lower frequencies, not to mention the fact that in the kilohertz range, you're usually looking at audio amplification, which doesn't look like a single sine wave at some frequency. What this is primarily for is RF amplification. And if I, if you remember what I pulled up before with the RF ranges, this is in the, the high frequency range. So this would be something that you would use for a radio transmitter. In fact, this is what your cell phone uses, this is the kind of amplifier that your cell phone would use for transmitting. And it's how they pack a one watt amplifier into a tiny little package. You know, this big. And manage to do some battery life. So you have a tuned circuit here. You see the, the inductor and the capacitor. This particular one is more like 8 megahertz instead of 7 megahertz. But the principle still holds. You'll notice that this is still a fairly small inductance and a fairly small capacitance. Still, only a pretend MOSFET. Hmm? Yes, it is a pretend MOSFET. I could have also used a bipolar transistor here. 
but this is a very simple MOSFET. So what you see here is this is the voltage across the transistor. Or this is the voltage, no, this is the voltage across the load. It's also the voltage across the transistor, technically. Yeah, which is also this. So you'll notice that it is these kind of humps that come down to a zero slope, zero voltage, when you reach ground and the transistor turns back on. So when it turns on, let's go here. When it turns on, the current sort of increases, and then it turns off. It dumps this current into the capacitor and the load, and then the voltage returns back to zero before it has to switch on. So this is a very good way to make your transistor happy. It won't have to conduct a lot of current when you turn it back on, like it did in the class C. The other thing that it's, that's neat is it reduces something called the Miller effect, which means that whatever is driving it has a lower, lower impedance to contend with here. Okay. But obviously this is still an issue because you need one hell of a tuned circuit afterwards in order to make this resemble anything that looks like an actual sine wave path. There is a solution to this. So this is a single-ended class E amplifier. Again, one, one active device. And the other end of the load is connected to ground. However, it is possible to have a push-pull class E, very much like the push-pull emitter follower that pulled to the positive and negative rails. So now, you've got two class E amplifiers that, if you notice, are driven out of phase. This one's now this one's off, this one's on. And the voltage across the load now looks a little bit more sinusoidal. You can get this back to looking very sinusoidal with a little bit of filtering. But if your load is already resonant, it will take care of some of that. And you'll notice that the same thing is still true. The transistor is turning on with zero voltage across it and zero current. The current through it rises when it turns off. Or the current through it, yeah, rises when it turns on. But at the time when it turns on, okay. <coughs> so class E amplifiers are commonly used for hobbyists making their own AM transmitters because the height of the thing that's not really like a sine wave there can be controlled by modulating the input voltage, which you will see. So unlike before, when this was jumping up to about 180 volts, now it's only jumping up to about 75. And you do that by controlling the input here. And you might ask how you do that. The answer is usually with another amplifier. Incidentally, this is how the plasma speaker of mine in the display case works. It has a class E amplifier driving a flyback transformer. And the way that the audio is superimposed is with a class D amplifier, which I will show you next. So this is a class D amplifier. It's a very, very simplistic block diagram form. So 
what you see here is the input. This is your audio frequency, in this case, input, low audio frequency. And then this here is your modulation frequency. The way that a class D amplifier works is by creating a waveform here that is averaged to form something that looks like the input. So you'll notice the average of this area here that has very, very, very narrow peaks, very, very narrow on times. The average of this would be low, whereas the average over here, where you're almost, where you're on almost all the time, would be very high. And the way that you average in an analog circuit is with inductors and capacitors. Because both of them, an inductor in series will block your high frequencies and capacitor ground will absorb the high frequencies. So if you look at the current here, despite this being switched very quickly, the current doesn't change direction nearly as often. And that's a result of the inductor. Okay. So again, why is this why is this important? Well, unlike the class E and the class C amplifiers, there is not a tuned load on this amplifier. Which means that unlike them, it is a wideband amplifier instead of narrow band. It can operate over a large frequency range. And as a result, you can use it for audio amplification. Audio amplification tends to be a wide frequency range. It's from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is 20 hertz to 200 hertz is one decade, 200 hertz to 2 kilohertz is the second decade, and 200 hertz to, or 2, two kilohertz to uh, 20 kilohertz is three decades. So by having a frequency that's fast enough here, you usually use something more like 200 kilohertz for the input, for the triangle wave to be compared to. You can amplify audio signals with a switching amplifier. Okay, now questions. So, um, can you use, so you, you can't really use class B for like high frequencies in general? Right, well, so that's the issue of class B, the issue with class B. Your, your filter here, your low pass filter that you form with these two will block really high frequencies. The purpose is to block this over here, in this case the one kilohertz noise that you'll get from the switching. But if you wanted to use you know, a class E amplifier to amplify megahertz, you might want 10 megahertz switching frequency or 20 megahertz switching frequency. And that's a little bit ridiculous. There's this guy called Nyquist. Yes, so um, that is a good point. It's more in the signals and systems world. If you, so class D is kind of in the realm of sampling, kind of. And if you've taken 246, you'll know that if you sample a signal at less than twice the frequency of the signal, you won't be able to properly reconstruct it without knowing that the, that the signal is higher in frequency. It could be any multiple of that. And that's what the night whisper rate means. Other questions? So the purpose of the triangle wave is that it gives you a linear ramp up and down. In some cases, 
you can use a sawtooth wave, but a triangle wave is nice because it doesn't have that one really fast transition. It has two relatively slow slopes. But yes, the triangle wave is very important there. And it's what the Wolfsburg modulation is. Why would you choose a class D over a class, say, AB? Ah, so when you've got 10,000 watts of speakers to drive, you remember how I said that the class B would potentially be up to like 73% efficient? So when you have 10,000 watts of speakers to drive, 73% efficient really doesn't cut it. So you've still got, you know, what is it? That's 300 watts? No, 3,000 watts. Yeah, the power dissipated. Although in reality, nearly everything uses Class D from your car stereo to your cell phone. Yep. For the same reasons. What is the efficiency on Class D? Really high. It could go over 95%. Yeah. Sheesh. It depends on what you're using as your active elements. meters aren't completely accurate, but you can probably see that there's a lot less current being drawn when this amplifier isn't doing anything. Let's the wobble meter. Hmm? The wobble meter. Yep. See, it's doing almost nothing. 
However, Thank you. 